Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Okada from Beyond Clean, and on behalf of everyone on the Beyond Clean team, I would like to welcome you to Can't Touch This, Exploring the World of Surface Cleaning Virtual Conference. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our event sponsor, 3M, for helping make this exciting day of virtual learning possible. We're so excited you've chosen to kick off your weekend by joining us for this one-of-a-kind event dedicated to surface cleaning and disinfection best practices. I understand you probably have a lot going on between work and home, so I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being dedicated to education and for doing something that will help you grow as a sterile processing professional. So sit back and relax and start that sterilizer load if you happen to be at work. It's time to get the event started. Our first speaker, Dr. Alistair Keene, is a professor of medical nanotechnology at the University of the Highlands and Islands in Inverness, Scotland. He's considered an industry expert in the field of nanotechnology and is a highly sought after speaker for his knowledge and subject matter expertise. Dr. Keene's enthusiasm and passion for nanotechnology inspired the start of his own company, which is dedicated to nanotechnology consultancy and contract coding services. services. Dr. Keene will introduce the newly developed concept of nanosurfaces and its impact on bacterial detection. How well do we truly know how viruses and bacteria interact with the surfaces all around us in our hospitals? Dr. Keene is here to help us answer this burning question. So without further ado, kicking off our spotlight on surface cleaning, Dr. Alistair Keene. Thank you very much for that excellent introduction, Adam. We really appreciate it. Um, and it's really nice to be with everyone this, this morning. We're covering many different time zones from Adam in California, who's very early in the morning for him, 5 a.m., I think. And um, we're at um, 1, 1 p.m. In the, in the UK, and it's a nice, nice sunny day. And we have your president with us for, for company as well in, in the UK. Um, so I, I sh hopefully you can see my first slide. I, I notice also that my beard is a lot grayer than my cartoon, <laughs> which was done a few years ago. Um, my background is as a, a physicist. Um, so I, I should say at this point that I have not trained medically. I've come into the, the world of biology and life sciences very recently, and it's a very steep le learning curve for me. But um, I've sure learned a lot in the last couple of years in my position um, at the University of the Highlands and Islands in Inverness, Scotland. We also work very closely with the National Health Service in the UK, in Scotland, it's NHS Scotland, and up in the Highlands and Islands, we, we have a, also a division of, of the NHS. So I work closely with colleagues at um, Rigmore Hospital, which is in the centre of Inverness, um, quite regularly, I, I talk to consultants, infection control staff, and to be very honest, I am in awe of the work that people do in hospitals. So I'm just here humbly to try and help you. And if you have any questions after this meeting, I'd love to answer or have a chat with you. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to, presentation will take about um, 50 minutes, and we're going to go through various different things. Um, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of fun as, fun as well. Um, hopefully, I'll explain a little bit about what nanotechnology actually is. Um, and because I've been in industry for many years, my interest is...
Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry, I think uh, Dr. Keen cut out for a second, so let me try to get him back, and uh, we'll return back to the presentation in one second. Hang on. Hi, everybody. Sorry, bear with us while we try to get Dr. Keen back. I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, I did, would like to remind you some uh, of the conference flow and some other things you can see. Uh, up in the right-hand corner of your screen, you can see some downloadable documents that are provided for you by our speakers today, as well as 3M, our event sponsor. Um, and uh, down in the right-hand corner, you can also see uh, our speaker bios and links to social media. So one second while we work through some of these technical difficulties, I promise we'll be right back with Dr. Keen in one second, and uh, we'll continue with the conference. Adam, audience, I've tried refreshing my browser. Can you hear me, Adam? Yes, we can hear you again. Thank you so much for refreshing. All right, I, uh, yeah. feel free to continue on. I think we lost you uh, right at the beginning of the slide, right at the end of the last slide. Okay, Adam, if you can hear me, that's fantastic. I'll, I'll continue and I'll whiz through the slide, okay? All right, sounds good. Excellent. Just let me know again if, if I cut out. Okay, I'll keep an eye on the chat. So I um, thanks for like thanks for understanding that everyone. So essentially I was talking about Zeno's paradox, where if you cut something in half and half again, you'll never ever finish it. But from a physics point of view, that could never happen because eventually you'll get down to the molecular atomic scale and it's very hard to start cutting atoms in half. Oh, see, so just moving on to what actually is touching. Well, if you touch the, t the surface of a table, um, but if you look at it from a physicist's point of view, when you get close to the surface of the table, your finger doesn't actually touch the table. What you're experiencing is Pauli's exclusion pr principle, which says that essentially atoms and electrons can't exist in the same place. If that was possible, um, essentially everything would collapse into singularity and we wouldn't be able to exist. So the fact that we can't physically touch anything, by physically not touching, it means the atom's touching. When your finger goes close to the surface, you're feeling energy forces around those atoms. 
Um, and that's important because, yeah, we can't physically touch something, but it's what happens at surfaces because we have gas, we have molecules, we have kinds of things happening there that allow things to be, such as molecules, to be transferred from one surface to another using electrostatic forces. So that's a, a kind of physicist's pers perspective of what touching is. What do surfaces look like? Um, am I still with everyone, Adam? Yep, you're good to go. Excellent, excellent. So just an example of surfaces here. So in host the hospital environment, we'll have a lot of plastic surfaces, aluminium surfaces, a lot of stainless steel. Zooming in with an electron microscope on the top left-hand side, we're looking at wood where you see a kind of fibrous structure, which is the cellulose with, within wood. On the right-hand side, we have um, plastic. Plastic can present all kinds of morphologies. On the bottom right, we have a metal surface, which has had a scratch through it. Um, and when you zoom into that, that really presents a high surface area of rough material, which is very attractive for a molecule or a microbe to stick to. On the bottom left, we have um, a skin. You can see platelets of the skin. And after you've had your a, a jab, then that's the kind of damage you see to the skin, which um, quickly um, goes through a self-healing process. So surfaces, that surfaces are fascinating to a physicist, especially so, someone working in, in nanotechnology. And when we look at these surfaces, we really want to know how bugs interact with them because if you get a rough surface that's passive, bugs just love living in such areas. It's like a whole community, a city for bugs to live in, and you can get of high populations of bugs active on surfaces for a long time. For instance, um, if we take stainless steel and it looks very clean, it looks polished, it looks shiny, if we look at it with an electron micro microscope, we'll see a lot of morphology there, a lot of structure, and we may well even see populations of microbes um, living happily in there. So surfaces are very, very important. We know that um, COVID is mainly transmitted via aerosol, via the air, but um, if someone coughs if they have COVID, that, there's a good chance that that vapor is going to condense on a surface, and that surface will then play host to the virus. Um, also, hospital-acquired infections are still hugely important, even though we, we have this pandemic. And we do know that microbes will survive for a very long time on stainless steel, from days up to weeks and possibly months. So I'm going to take a step back. So my I have a position now at the University of the Highlands and Islands in Inverness in Scotland, and I'm setting up a department of medical nanotechnology um, so we want to use nanotechnology to you do useful things in healthcare. I've already worked in nanotechnology and physics and chemistry, looking at fuel cells, batteries, lots of amazing things are being done there with nanotechnology. But my future interest is in life sciences and healthcare and how I can make hospitals smarter, better and safer for patients and staff to be in. So let's take a step back. What is nanotechnology? Well, nanotechnology is very, very small. If we think going back to the 1950s, the big revolution was in microelectronics. That's the biggest technical technological revolution in the history of the universe. The electronics revolution went from having one transistor in your finger to having the potential to have billions and billions of transistors on the tip of your finger. Microelectronics is kind of coming a, a, a bit to, to a halt now in, the, in the, the rate of its evolution. And nanotechnology is seen as a, a follow on from microtechnology. So microtechnology, you're operating at the scale of about one thousandth of a millimeter. With nanotechnology, we're operating at the scale of one thousandth of a micron or one millionth of a millimeter. And that takes us to a scale which is not quite down at the atomic scale, but at the scale where you're working with clumps of atoms or molecules. And when I get asked what nanotechnology is, I ask, 
I ask people just to look out the window and look at nature, trees, grass, plants, the sky, water, everything produces its functional operation at the nanoscale. If we look at the picture on the left-hand side of the screen, now apologies for the wrong spelling of nanoparticles, but we have an image of um, nanoparticles deposited on a surface. The European Union definition of a nanomaterial is a piece of material or a device that is sub 100 nanometers in scale. Okay, so these nanoparticles you can see sitting there are of of the size of, uh, they're about 10 nanometers in diameter. Now, incredibly, we can zoom into one of these nanoparticles and that's the image at the center of the screen here. And this is using an ultra high resolution transmission electron microscope at a, a facility called Diamond in the UK, which um, houses a building which houses an ultra high precision microscope. And we can get such resolution that we can see imaging image points which are not atoms it's you can't see an atom which and there's a lot of physics behind that but what the microscope can pick up is an image where the energy fields around each atom are represented and we can refocus that image into virtual images of atoms so we are actually seeing lines and lines of individual platinum atoms making up one individual nanoparticle. And then on the right-hand side, we've got a, a beautiful blue butterfly. If we take a small section of a butterfly wing and put it in the microscope, we see nanostructures that are beautifully ordered. Um, and these are called metamaterial optical nanostructures. So the, the wing of a blue butterfly is actually black in color, but because of the way it manipulates the reflected light, using this three-dimensional nanoscale diffraction grating, it can, it, it's evolved itself over millions of years to, to, for that color, either for protection or for attraction. But natural nanotechnology has had millions of years to evolve, and we've had a few decades, and we're just trying to do a little bit of what nature does much better, but do, do things that are, are useful. At the university in Inverness, we're going to be looking at lots of different things. How, how can nanotechnology make a positive impact in healthcare? There are so many different ways. We're just at the beginning. Uh, one potential is for um, drug release, drug delivery and drug release. So you're seeing an image on the top left of a stent inside an artery using drug elution and nano coatings to control the elution of the drug. On the top right, we have a nanostructured surface that will build up a nanostructured electrochemical cell to kill bugs, and we'll go into that in more detail later. Bottom left is an amazing picture. You can see small gold pieces in the background, which are gold-coated electronic contacts for a bionic hand product that we do coating for. In the center, you can see a, almost like a, a salmon pink substrate this salmon pink substrate is 100% gold. And the reason it looks gold is because we have deposited gold nanoparticles to make a nanophotonic sensor. And the, it doesn't look gold because it is a nanostructured gold coating. And the properties of that are determined by the structure of the nanoparticle. Um, and there's a lot of amazing physics in, in this, but we're utilizing that and I'll go into more detail about that later on in the presentation. Um, bottom right, um, what devices? So if we can manufacture a coating that's antimicrobial, antiviral, where do we put it? Do we put it on door handles? Do we put it on touch surfaces? We also have the potential to put it on implants as well. So implants that can go inside the body, um, which have the potential to carry contamination in with them. But if we have an ultra-active antimicrobial coating, then we might not prevent infection, but there's a high chance that we will reduce the probability of someone acquiring an infection via this mechanism. So nanotechnology and biology, 
they're very synergetic um, and there's a huge interest throughout the world in moving rapidly forward in this area in both organic, inorganic and biological nanotechnology. Let's, let's take a look at, um, at COVID, for instance. So COVID is a, is a, a, a very honest a, 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 a organic nanoparticle and it has various different components. The, it has the, the core RNA, DNA, it has um, proteins, it has lipid membranes. So it's quite an in, interesting structure. But vi and viruses, they survive by breaking through cell walls, taking over cells, replicating breaking back out again and then invading a, a, another cell. But from a physicist's point of view, there's they're not a very solid structure. So there's quite a lot we can think about doing using light and nanotechnology to deactivate a, a virus. So for nanoparticles, for instance, so nanoparticles can inactivate viruses, bacteria, and also fungi yeasts. And, they, they have a, a nature, and I won't go into the physics, but essentially it goes back to um, Maxwell's laws, which were described by James Clark Maxwell nearly 200 years ago. And it's to do with nanoscaled electric fields and how you can generate electrons with high energy and disrupt organic materials. So there's a lot we can do there. But nanoparticles, because of such properties, we can also use them to make sensors with them and then there's various various um, geometries of nanoparticle that we can manufacture to um, to bind to various surfaces, inhibit viruses moving into cell. We can target things like cancer cells with nanoparticles and heat them up and destroy cancer cells. We can target cancer cells with functionalized nanoparticles. Um, so very, very exciting what we can do in, in, in this field. So more specifically now, um, I want to talk about a, a project I've been involved with for about eight years now. Um, and this is um, an antimicrobial, um, potentially antiviral. I can take the potentially out now because I've got some exciting new data that is included, I think, in this presentation. So. Gincoa is a company based in Liverpool in the UK. It's a company that works on a technology called physical vapor deposition, PVD. And you might have seen it in the back of magazines, etc., because um, a lot of cosmetic jewellery watches are coated by PVD to give them a nice titanium or gold coloured finish on them. This is a physical technique which allows you to generate ultra hard, ultra dense coatings. And this technique is used by um, the oil and gas industry to coat their drill bits with. Um, so you can imagine how good these, these coatings are. But with Sincoa, we've been, we've been looking at the nanostructure of surfaces. And um, we've discovered that if we produce various materials in a coating with specific structures, then we can produce a very exciting antimicrobial coating. So as I mentioned earlier, yes, we have the epidemic. Hospitals have been swamped, but hospital-acquired infections are still with us. They, they are still a huge problem, certainly in Europe, and, and I'm sure in North and South America as well. So we believe that there's a, a, there's a real need to put in active surfaces where if they become contaminated, they will rapidly self-clean themselves and deactivate infections, possible infection transmission from such surfaces. So this is some historical data from the US just showing the, the scale of the problem of HIAs in hospitals. And we believe that by coating such things as simple things like, um, and the technology is economical enough that we can do this, coat simple touch surfaces and protect them, coat touch surfaces. Now, in a specific um, form of this coating, because it's a metal oxide, we can design the composition of that coating so that it becomes transparent. So it's very exciting that we have now developed a transparent material. So it's a plastic 
coated with our material that is actively antimicrobial. So we actually have trials running with a train company in the UK um, to put our coatings onto touch screens and then monitor those. So how do we put these coatings down? It's done in a vacuum um, using plasma. This is a real physical process. We use the plasma to generate the metals and the gases and to form the coating on, on the surface. This is industry standard and it's scalable to very, very large scale. And in fact, um, to tell you, just to explain how the economics work, if you scale up to such a large industry, industry like um, food packaging, so if you open a packet of um, potato chips on the inside, there's an aluminium coating that's been done by exactly this technique. So it is eminently scalable. And essentially, what we do is we take a substrate, generate the plasma, the vapour of material, and coat the surface. What we've done for our antimicrobial coating, normally we produce coatings which are extremely flat and high quality. But we discovered if we began to change the operating parameters and tune the surface to produce a specific morphology on the surface, um, we, we discovered that we had a very, very antimicrobial surface. And that works by essentially, um, we test that by putting microorganisms onto surfaces and determining um, how long they survive for. Um, and we discovered that with this topology we're arranging, we have very rapid kill rate of bugs and surfaces. And one thing to note here is, Traditionally, it's been extremely hard to put an antimicrobial coating onto stainless steel because in terms of durability, stainless steel is great. Um, but if you, it's hard to put something on there that's antimicrobial and is extremely durable. So we believe that our coating is the, hard, the micro hardness is harder than stainless steel and it is extremely durable. So we're, we're very pleased with that. How, how does our surface kill a bug? Well, it's going back to my laws of physics. If you generate surfaces which have a very low radius of curvature, where you have electrons, then you can generate extremely high nano-scaled electric fields. And if you have a, a bug or a bacteria in contact with this surface, then anything that's between the bug and the surface will act as an electrolyte to set up a, a, a voltage, which will extract electrons and potential metal ions from our surface. These hot electrons and metal ions are very, very disruptive to cell walls, DNA, RNA. Um, they can be so disruptive that there's, there's no resistance built up to such mechanism. And actually what we're doing is really mimicking nature here. That's, that's a wonderful thing to do. There are lots of natural surfaces that are antimicrobial and we are just using our knowledge of physics to try and reproduce what, what nature is doing. We've had our surfaces tested at various different laboratories under various different standards but the important thing to note is is that um, we are seeing kill rates of up to about um, log six kill rates within, within a, a couple of hours so these are, are very very active surfaces. We've looked at various different microorganisms and I mentioned also that we had um, developed a transparent antimicrobial coating. Um, so this might be of interest to some of you. This is, this is a project that was um, um, funded by the UK government under their Innovate scheme. Um, and then you can see the partners were um, Gincoa, University of Liverpool and Diamond Coatings. So we have um, volunteers cleaning agency, hairdressing salons, where we um, were using um, visors, and some of the visors were coated with our antimicrobial coating, and some weren't. So they were not inoculated with, with microorganisms. We're looking at microorganisms that are naturally occurring in the real environment. The data we got from that's really encouraging. So essentially, if you look at visors, which are just standard or had an anti-reflection coating, there's a significant cultural loading on these surfaces after, after we, we studied them. 
but the coatings which we had coated with our antimicrobial visor had much lower count of bugs on them. So that's really amazing. We have a transparent coating for plastic that actively kills bugs on the surface. Okay, so those are bugs, but now we have the new topic of um, of COVID, SARS and um, COVID two, um, and this was a this is quite a well known study now. It was um, carried out in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the the question posed to the researchers was: If we have a virus on a surface, how long is it going to hang around there? Um, so the, the the red one is the most recent virus. The the blue trace is a is a previous SARS virus. So looking at the sur survival, just basically in aerosol, the, the, the virus can survive for hours. Um, if we look going to the right, plastics, stainless steel, cardboard. In fact, interestingly, cardboard was quite efficient at, at disrupting the virus, and that's probably to do with the cellulose, the nanocrystalline cellulose that's within wood. But plastics and stainless steel are actually very good hosts for COVID, so we need to do something about this. One thing we can do is utilise copper. Um, copper has been known to be antimicrobial for about 7,000 years. It's, um, it's used in India for thousands of years to purify water. Um, it was used in the Bronze Age, where if a soldier in the Bronze Age had a flesh wound, there are etchings of this, drawings of this. Their colleagues would scrape some of their bronze blade into the wounds because it was known that copper would prevent potential um, infection within the wood. So it's been known for years that copper is antiviral, but we can't put copper everywhere. It's too expensive. We can't make surfaces and instruments out of copper because even though copper oxidizes, it's still antimicrobial, but it needs a lot of cleaning. It's not a very durable surface. And as I mentioned, it would be very, very expensive to put copper everywhere. And so that's where we think, okay, let's bring in some real physics and nanotechnology and, and look for solutions to making antimicrobial antiviral surfaces that are durable surfaces. And this is a nice illustration from one of my colleagues Professor Bill Keevil, who's at the University of Southampton. He's been looking at um, copper surfaces for years. Um, and it's not just the copper surface, it's the morphology of the surface. Of, as I mentioned right at the start of the presentation, it's the bugs love rough surfaces, but we can also use that against them. So we've done some experiments where we make ultra flat copper. So I can take a silicon wafer and put atomically flat copper on that surface. And lo and behold, that copper is completely inactive against bugs or viruses because it's so flat. You need topology to allow energy to be created to make the, the copper active. And what we're looking at here is a, a virus. I think this is a flu virus on stainless steel, but also on the right-hand side on a copper surface. And if you look at the small clusters on the right-hand side, those are virus particles that are disintegrating in front of our eyes, well, in front of our electron eyes by sitting on copper. And the copper ions using our nano electrochemical cell are being extracted from the surface and disrupting the, the, the walls and core of these viral particles. So that's really nice. You can see in real time with an electron microscope that you can kill or sorry, I apologize, you can destroy a, a, a virus. Now, I said that potentially our material is antiviral. Well, I'm pleased to say that just very recently we have some, some antiviral data on our surfaces. So how, how do you um, how do you look at the activity of a virus uh, with respect to our, our materials? Well, that the tests we've used here, and I confess to not being an expert in antiviral testing, but as I understand it, what we do is we have a, a Petri dish and then we have a, a monolayer coating of a, a macrophage cell, and then we dope that surface with, with, with virus particles. The virus particle will then try to inhabit the cells 
um, and use the cell to replicate, break back out and replicate in neighbouring cells. And essentially what you'll do is kill the cell and then move on to another cell and kill that as well. And the way we monitor that is using a staining technique. So staining techniques can be used to find dead cells and can be used to, to find living cells. So that's a very efficient way to look at, to see if our virus is active. If the virus is, a, is active, we're going to find a lot of dead cells in the Petri dish. And then we bring these um, plates into contact with our coatings to get the virus close to our antimicrobial, antiviral surfaces. So in this case, we looked at a gastroenteritis coronavirus, which is a virus safety level two, and this was carried out in a, a laboratory in Spain. But we're very fortunate to see that um, we're getting some really exciting antiviral data. We're not hugely surprised by this because if we can make a nanosurface that will disrupt a, a, a bacterial um, microbe, and there's evidence that we have that if that's the case, then viruses are not going to like sitting on that surface. And it's well known that um, nanomaterials, nanocopper, nanosilver, does have an anti antiviral properly properties, but it's all about controlling those surfaces to make them safe and durable and effective. So that's how we're killing viruses. We're going to use our nano coatings. And we're at very early stage. We're going to carry on the research up in Inverness, start testing with various companies, and hopefully some of the bigger medical companies will start offering products which are actively antimicrobial, antivirally protected using our technology. So for the, the last part of my talk, I've got 10 or 15 minutes or so, um, I'm going to talk about how we can find bugs and viruses at an extremely low concentration. And when I say a low concentration, with the techniques I'm about to explain, we can potentially do measurements on one very on one virus particle or one one uh, microbe using our techniques. So one of the projects I'm working on now, we're looking at a technique called Raman scattering. So Raman scattering is a way of using light to look at materials and tell you what those materials are. And it does this by light scattering. It's exactly why the sky is blue. The sky is blue because of something called rally scattering, where you elastically scatter photons in the upper sky and scatter blue. Um, Raman scattering is where you interact a photon with a material and it loses a bit of energy, and that amount of energy corresponds to the material you were looking at, and you can identify the material. And at the bottom slide is just a, a Raman being used in actually Mont Monterey Bay Aquarium to probably look for algae or, or something in, in, in water. And Raman spectroscopy has been around for many, many decades. The big advances that have been made have taken it, and the gentleman in the turbine is Mr. Raman himself, who invented this technique or discovered it. And it used to be that instruments would be laboratory scale, sit on benches. But the things that are happening now in technology with electronics, detectors, light sources, on the right-hand side, we have a Raman spectrometer that will fit in your pocket. And the economics has changed dramatically now from hundreds of thousands of dollars down to thousands of dollars now for a, a Raman spectrometer. So that means that they can be used in many, many environments now. So we are taking such simple Raman spectrometers. Here's an example of some data from Raman spectrometer that's been used in a life science experiment to measure activity of nitric oxide in a biosystem. So it's used for many, many different things. So what we're going to throw at it now is nanotechnology. Um, I won't go into this, this in detail, but essentially, if I can make a nanostructured surface, a nanostructured metallic surface, it acts as a nano aerial and it interacts with the light and the light scattering and we have the potential to amplify what is an inefficient Raman process. In a normal Raman process, one photon in a million 
has the right kind of scattering event that we can measure by using nanostructured metallic surfaces, we can amplify that signal by up to 1 million times 1 million times, so about 10 to the 12 times. If you can amplify at that kind of scale, that gives you the opportunity to do extremely sensitive measurements. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to make nanoparticles, which I've been working on for about 20 years now. And in fact, we've, we've We've, we've um, started up a new company where we've developed a technology which allows us to make nanoparticles and deposit them onto surfaces in a benchtop instrument. So we've spent 10 years simplifying this technology. And if you want to deposit nanoparticles on a surface, essentially you open the door, put in your substrate, close the door and press a button. And hey presto, you can produce nanoparticles. So I've got an example here of nanoparticles. And if you look, Within the nanoparticle, you can see some small dots, which are representative of the atoms within those nanoparticles. So we have to get the really good control of the nanoparticles and um, to make our photonic sensor to amplify our Raman signal. I've got an example here of just for fun. I've got an example here of a, what we call a large nanoparticle, which is still pretty small. But again, if you look there, you can see lines within the nanoparticle which are lines of atoms rowing up to make this a uh, crystalline nanoparticle of about 15, 20 nanometers diameter. But it's these corners, it's these radiuses that gives us the electromagnetic effect that amplifies the nanoparticle. So I, I showed this substrate earlier, um, and this is our pink nanoplasmonic gold surfaces. So now we've got our substrate that might, we, we might be able to use to amplify our Raman signal. So what we do with that is we turn it into dipstick. So we take a bit of our Raman amplifier material, we put it onto dipstick. Um, and then simply what we do is take um, a sample of the material we want to look at. We put it into a solvent, say some water, and we drop it onto the surface and then we measure the Raman spectrum. So this spectrum is, is looking at a, just a simple caffeine molecule um, because we just wanted to exhibit the sensitivity of our technique. Um, essentially, without going into too much detail, the orange spectrum is at, at the bottom is standard Raman on a concentrated um, um, amount of caffeine in liquid. But if you then go up to some of the, the, the spectrum of the higher peaks are using our substrate, but we're dramatic, dramatically reducing the caffeine concentration. And we're at the point now where we can measure between parts per billion and parts per trillion of caffeine in liquid, which is a quite a stunning measurement to make. So how, how do we apply this to, to COVID? And um, rather than looking at a whole virion or virus um, uh, particle, because it, exists, it, um, it comprises of several different components, we can take it apart. So we can look for specific parts of uh, a signature of, of a, a virion. So Samsung recently did a, a simulation. So they looked at modeling spike proteins associated with viruses and simulating the Raman spectra from those. So we're going to advance with our surface enhanced Raman sensor and we will be looking at, um, at um, spike proteins and, uh, and then applying that to viruses to, and seeing how sensitively we can detect them on surfaces. And the same, it's the same kind of thing with, um, with microbes. Microbes have chemicals associated with them, molecules such as um, polyliposaccharides. Um, they're, 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 if you can see those, they're an indication that you have um, you have specific organic matter on surfaces. And I'm pleased to say that um, we have a consortium that's been awarded uh, a grant by the University of Glasgow. Um, we have six months to do a proof of principle. So we're working with the university, I beg your pardon, we're working with the University of Strathclyde to do a proof of principle whereby we will put sensitive molecules of interest onto our sensor 
and see how low a detection level of um, these materials we, we can get to. And we'll finish up this, um, this research project by doing a demonstration in a NHS environment with a, a molecule of interest, detect that at a small level, and then we're going to use essentially data harvesting and artificial intelligence so that if we pick up something that's of interest, then we can tell the hospital management system very rapidly that there's a surface that might have a pathogen on that surface. So we're very excited about this project. So I'm just going to finish up with a couple of slides. Um, I'm going back to the whole point of this, this meeting, you know, we, what's a good surface? I'm, I hope I've described, you know, what nanotechnology is a little bit, how we can apply it and what we're trying to do usefully with nanotechnology to, to help in the future. So think about a hospital surface. What would be a good touch, touch surface? Well, you want, you want it to be hard and scratch resistant and certainly stainless steel and many alloys are that. But what they are not is actively antimicrobial and antiviral. So we want to add, add that functionality to a surface. Okay, our, our surface does look rough, so it might not look shiny, but our roughness is at the nanoscale, which is at the optical wavelength scale or smaller. So when optical light shines on our surface, it still looks shiny. You can't see the roughness with your eye because it's nano roughness that we're we are working with. Um, I also have to say that, yes, if we can functionalize the surface, make it antiviral, we are we will have to clean it. This isn't a solution for everything. Our surface will go hand in hand with good cleaning practice. We can never get away from that. But what our surface will do, it will reduce the probability of infection in hospital. That allows surfaces to stay clean. And then finally, biofilms are a huge topic as well. If a biofilm gets hold on a surface, even if we have an antimicrobial coating, if that biofilm gets on top of that surface, then bugs will grow on top of that biofilm. So we're looking at future coatings using carbon materials where other surface, other materials will not like to adhere a surface. So we're looking at nanotechnology to prevent the buildup of biofilms as well. So Adam, I'd just like to finish up by saying um, I've just taken on this new role in Inverness, so I'm going to spend the next 10 years progressing nanotechnology in Inverness. We're opening a new life sciences innovation centre on a beautiful campus. Please come and visit us if you get a chance to visit Scotland. I'd be happy to welcome you and show you around. And finally, we're using nanotechnology to find bugs and make surfaces safer. We'll continue to offer technology um, and we'll work in the background to do stuff, to do useful things for you and help you keep beyond clean. Thank you very much, Adam. All right, thank you, Dr. Keene. That was, I mean, incredibly fascinating, some game-changing game stuff for sterile processing. And as far as surfaces and all these things that, um, you know, we we deal with every day. I remember that uh, we did a study in our own department um, looking at ATP testing or protein testing um, with the surfaces in our department. And basically everything that we touched was incredibly contaminated. Everything that we were in that touched, anyone touched in decontam was just incredibly contaminated. No matter what we did for cleaning, even if we were wiping things down daily or after every shift. Um, so these are really, I mean, fascinating things. Uh, we did get some great questions from the audience, so I'm going to go ahead and pose some of those to you and uh, let you uh, uh, take your shot at some of these. So um, one thing here is, uh, does this coating need to be reactivated with a chemical? Yeah, that, I didn't get a chance to talk about that. So um, the answer, quick answer is no. In slightly more detail, um, if we use copper or silver is also antimicrobial, but copper um, works by transferring copper ions to microbes and killing them in, in that fashion. Uh, also, if you have a thin film of copper, it's not highly durable. The coatings we make are 
ultra hard metal oxide PVD coatings, so you could coat drill bits with them. And because we're utilizing high electric fields and electrons to destroy viruses, we will never run out of electrons. So the, the surface, the coat, the surface does not need to be activated by chemical. Um, and it's going to be very, we haven't done durability studies on it yet, but it's going to be active for months, if not years, um, without any other treatment. And that was actually that brings us right to the next question, which what is what is the lifespan of that protection that that coating? Yeah, um, so I, I gave some examples of us coating onto plastic, and we can do that because we've thermalized the process, so we were essentially a room temperature process. If we coat onto plastic, the life will not be so long because the plastic degrades. If we coat onto metal. We don't know what the lifetime is yet. We just haven't had the time to do that testing. But my suspicion is that if we optimize the coating on, say, stainless steel, for instance, we'll, we'll get a lifetime of years on that surface. As long as we have a, you know, a cleaning regime that cleans the surface to keep it clean, it will remain actively antimicrobial. And because it, we're using a PVD technique, the coating is actually extremely thin. Typical coating thicknesses are about um, one micron or less, but because of the durability and the cleaning we do, we, we it's not like a coating. We essentially bind the materials together atomically, and that's why it's such a good coating. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, is there any evidence that commonly used surface disinfectants might interact or degrade a nanoparticle treated surface over time? Yes. So. Um, Chemicals will, will, will not affect the, the surface that we've developed. So the important thing to discriminate here is that I explained a lot of work we're doing with nanoparticles to make sensors. You saw the gold nanoparticles. The antimicrobial coating we have is not a coating of nanoparticles. It is a flat coating that we have nanostructured to give it this specific topology. So there, there are not nanoparticles that will be removed from the surface. We have made an ultra hard nanostructured surface. So it's, it's going to be, it won't be affected by um, common chemicals that are used for cleaning. Of course, if you bring in specific strong acids, then you could affect that surface like um, hydrochloric acid would affect it. But who wants to clean with hydrochloric acid? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, any sense of the duration of my antimicrobial activity using the nanoparticle surface treatments? Yeah, that's a similar question. And so, um, yeah, we, we haven't done durability. The two main tests we haven't done yet are the durability. Um, and we believe that that's very low risk. We, we believe from previous experience with such coatings that they are going to be extremely durable. The test that we need to do is make sure that we're making safe coatings. We don't want to hurt people with these coatings. So we are, we are making metal oxides from biocompatible materials, such as um, tantalum, titanium, which are biocompatible materials. But in Inverness, we will be doing toxicology studies on the surface to make sure that there's going to be no irritation on, on human skin from such surfaces, but we believe that they will be fully biocompatible. Very good. All right, so um, this is a sterile processing related question. And since most of the surfaces that we have in sterile processing, especially in that decontamination area, are stainless steel, um, do you think that those nanoparticle coatings would work on stainless steel surfaces like those? Exactly, they will. We'll, we're specifically targeting stainless steel because um, it's because obviously it's so um, there's so much stainless steel in hospitals. Another test we're going to do is with um, a company called um, Surgical Holdings in the UK, who um, manufacture and supply surgical instruments. So we have some of their product that we're coating. We also have um, material from a colleague. Um, Roger and um, Brazil, who may well be watching in Sao Paulo. Um, and what we're going to do is coat these materials, um, and then we will take them to South End Hospital in the UK, and we'll run them through, for instance, 600 wash cycles, and then we'll look at, at the activity of our coating 
after 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 this event to make sure that we have the durability. Um, but having worked in mass production, if I make something new, then I try and destroy it before anyone else does. <laughs> It's always a good principle, absolutely. And that, that was actually going to answer another question that we had was uh, um, on in surgical instruments, because that's a lot of what serial processing does. Um, these surgical instruments, if you can actually use your coding on those, that's a really um, amazing game changer for us because, um, you know, this antimicrobial coding could really help us in sterile processing, keeping things clean and then eventually sterile. Yeah, um, so there's a whole range of things from... Um touch surfaces like door handles to touch plates, you know, to orthopedic implants. So the technology which we're using at Genco just now in Liverpool, we're going to build up the capability in Inverness, engage with companies, and then hopefully partner companies to build up commercial coating plants for such products. So if anyone's listening who's interested in getting involved, then please get in touch with me. Absolutely. Really fascinating stuff. Um, one more here. So this one says, uh, are there any concerns about release of nanoparticles from a treated surface that could lead to exposure of people? An example might be a treated food contact surface. Yeah, that's a very good question, you know, because nano safety is very important and how nanopart nanoparticles can be very good for you. They can also be very bad for you, such as copper oxide nanoparticles are, are highly toxic. So at Inverness, we when we look at nanomaterials, we say what's bad about them, what's good about them. Let's control what we're doing. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, the coating we have does not comprise of nanoparticles on a surface. We've taken a flat surface and nanotextured that surface to give us the feature size we want, to give us the kill we want. So there will be no, there are no nanoparticles on the surface, and there will be no release of nanoparticles from the surface. Very good. Uh, I said it was the last question, but it's not. I did get a couple more here. So um, uh, here's one um, having to do, can you recoat a surface that has been previously coated? Yeah, another really good question. This is great. So before we coat surfaces, being, being physicists, what we do is we chemically clean the surface, we take it in the vacuum chamber, and then we generate a plasma over the surface. And that plasma has ionized gas we use the energy of that gas to remove the surface coating, and that removes any contamination. We can remove as much material as we want from the surface, and then we can add more material back onto that surface. So the answer is yes, we can take a surface, reprocess it, and recoat it as, as required. Amazing. And then when a surface gets damaged or scratched, does that coating disappear? If you scratch the surface, um, what tends to happen is that you will, because the, the, the coating has a very high micro hardness, but if you scratch a surface, you'll see a scratch and you'll think, oh, I've, I've damaged our coating. But what typically happens is that in the underlying substrate, and um, so you will see some damage, but typically the coating will go down into that scratch. And um, it's not 100% Say, you know, if it, there can be damage, you know, if you have some high impact, then you might damage the coating. And what happens there is that you, if you can get water vapor through a pinhole, there might be a very small amount of delamination. But that's something you can, you can work on. But we're using physics to make the best possible coatings available. Right. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Keen. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. This is a, an amazing, fascinating topic. Uh, if anyone out there has questions that we were not able to get to, you can send Dr. Keen an email and he will gladly answer them. After this session, your screen will automatically transition you to the next session. But as a reminder, there is a 15 minute break between these sessions throughout the conference today. If the registration page appears and you've already registered, just click that already registered link, enter your email address to enter the event. Uh, you will be able to access the CE survey and certificate by visiting beyondclean.net slash virtual events, and you will be automatically transferred to that page at the end of today's conference. All sessions will be available to you on demand to share and view after today's live event. Again, we're so glad you guys are here, and we'll see you again in about 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone.